Hello, my name is Windy Arini. I'm a program officer at Rao Wallenberg Institute Regional Asia Pacific Program based in Jakarta, Indonesia. Uh, our podcast will focus on key research findings on localizing human rights in the context of SDGs and promote the importance of public participation in local governance. Here with us today is Dr. Payal Tore from RTM Nagpur University, India. Hi, Payal, how are you? I'm fine, Windy, how are you? I'm good. Thanks. Um, so let's dive into it. Yep. Um, so please tell me a little bit about yourself and your role in this research. Uh, my name is Dr. Payal Taure. I am Senior Assistant Professor at the Postgraduate Teaching Department of Law, RTM Nagpur University, India. Uh, I have been uh, into this profession since last 15 years and I have my specialization in human rights and intellectual property laws and since March 2020 I am in association with RWI for this collaborative research project on the development of human rights uh, particularly for the local government and uh, with this uh, we are aiming to focus on localizing human rights in the context of sustainable development goals which are protecting basically like gender justice and environment protection. Okay, uh, so Payal, uh, this research focuses on uh, localizing human rights in the context of SDGs uh, with emphasis on gender and the environment uh, that later on actually uh, serve as the backbone of uh, the handbook that we developed together. Can you tell me a little bit about the research? What did you find? Uh, in this research, we made an attempt to analyze how local government and local stakeholders with their personal experiences, expertise, knowledge, collective actions, collective defense can participate and contribute in the sustainable development of the city and what efforts they should put in order to achieve the sustainable development goals and thereby make the city a livable city wherein no one can be left behind. Uh, both the phase one and phase two of our research mainly focuses on how the local government, particularly in Nagpur, work towards implementing human rights based approach through their development projects, policies, and analysis. The theoretical research is very well supported by the case studies, which mainly focuses on uh, the gender uh, equality issues and environmental protection issues. We have got some prominent output from this research, which were uh, used in the uh, making of this handbook. Great. and. Um... Based on your research, um, you captured uh, the commitment and efforts uh, of local governments that they have made towards human rights and SDGs. Uh, but in your opinion, why do you think local governments should focus on these issues of SDGs and human rights? Yes, uh, focusing on research on local government, uh, particularly for implementing human rights, is essential because as every form of crisis emerges at the local level, and hence a first line of defense as well as the first form of solution needs to be developed at the local level to achieve the human rights in the city, there are different ways with which local government can effectively foster the implementation of sustainable development goals. Similarly, the local governments have the power, they have the discretion, they have a particular role as well as responsibility with which they can infuse the human rights based approach within the cities by doing, uh, for example, gender specific living patterns or non-discriminatory service provision to the citizen, which includes refugees, migrants, etc., as well as fair employment practices. So I think uh, this is how the local government can work towards implementation of sustainable development goals. So part of your research findings is uh, about the existence of a legal framework on human rights and SDGs at the national and city levels. How do you see this practice 
um, support efforts in localizing human rights the context of SDGs, how important it is? Basically, there are three approaches for the assignment of powers to the local governments. That is the top-down, the bottom-up, or the combination of both the uh, governments at the central and the local level. And uh, this does help us in understanding the roles and responsibility which has assigned to the local government. For example, uh, the part four of the Constitution of India, that is the directive principles of the state policy, is a set of affirmative action plans which encompasses issues related to environment protection, gender equality, as well as economic opportunities, which needs to be uh, taken care by the local government as well. The role of local government is defined in uh, the schedule. 11 and schedule 12 of the constitution this schedule mentions about the accountability of the local government towards the protection of environment gender justice as well as the civic facilities which has been given to the citizen so the role and responsibility part of local government within the Indian fabric of law is clear and we suggest through this research that it is essential for every government to have clarity on the role of local government so that it will make easy for both, I mean for the local government as well as for the people of the city to understand their roles and responsibilities along with their limitations particularly while applying the human-based, human rights-based approach. Right. Uh, I think it's, it's very important to, to actually know who do what, uh, yeah. especially in, in, in different levels of governance. Yeah. Yes. And um, so just uh, another question is uh, from your research findings, uh, you actually explain quite a bit on public participation in local governance and different mod models that have been used so far. Uh, can you briefly share on that? Yes, as we have done the research, which focuses mainly on the sustainable development goals along with the human rights implementation. Uh, for example, the Sustainable Development Goal 5, which ensures particularly about women's effective participation and equal opportunity of leadership at all level, be it in the decision making in political, economic as well as public life. So in our research, we came across that the Nagpur city's local government, that is the Nagpur Municipal Corporation, has a reserve seat for women in the corporation. One third of the total number of seats are reserved for women in total. So women from scheduled caste, women from scheduled tribes, women from the backward classes, and these are all are combined under the marginalized group. So they all are also reserved in the corporation on a rotation basis. So the local government of Nagpur also constitute the women and child welfare committee which is headed by the women corporators of the city. So this committee works with the objective to provide equal economic opportunities to the women of the weaker section as well as women who are specially able. So I would also like to mention here about one of the case studies which we have conducted for this research that was of Bachat group which is the self women's self-help group. Now, in this particular case study, we came across that the Nagpur Municipal Corporation provides seed money to these group of women for a particular period of time. And with that seed money, these women can start their own businesses. They can set up their own skill-based uh, trade with which uh, wherein they can create some handicrafts and they can sell. And this is how the empowerment of women takes place. So uh, uh, if we see such type of activity which has been endorsed by the Nakhu Municipal Corporation improves the quality of life, self-confidence and self-dependency of this women Along with that, it equally satisfied the Sustainable Development Goal 5, which mentions about providing equal opportunities to women. 
so this this research does focuses on uh, this aspects wherein the nmc has contributed towards the sustain uh, in, uh, achievement of sustainable development goal by enhancing the economic rights of women all right so um just a little bit further on um public participation and how do you say it uh, implemented uh, in in Nagpur city uh, you mentioned several um, uh, methods so far or some examples actually in in the research uh, yeah. but what do you think or how do you think the current models or practices can be further enhanced yes actually uh, we can say that public participation is the basic foundation uh, of all the sustainable development goal and a meaningful public participation does involve seeking public inputs at the specific uh, points in the decision making process and on the specific issues where such input has a real potential to help in the shaping of the decision or action taken by the local government a uh, selection of right level and right form of public participation does make a lot of difference so public participation can be enhanced by providing information consultation with people and uh, obtaining feedbacks uh, from the people and involving the citizen in the decision making and uh, to collaborate with the people uh, during the implementation of that uh, decision does make a lot of difference in finalizing uh, how the public participation is going to create an impact on the achievement of sustainable development goal and in our research we do have mentioned about various models of public participation wherein uh, direct public participation indirect public participation and uh, sometimes specific public participation which is depending upon the need and requirement of that city can be encouraged but i would suggest here that a precise situational analysis is going to help the local government in finalizing which model of public participation they should use for a particular issue which they are going to address through their development policies right um you mentioned earlier there are sort of three types of participation that you find uh, in in your research, can you very briefly uh, elaborate on on all three of them? What what how they're different? Uh, there are basically three types of public participation, which are which is recognized globally. That is the direct participation, indirect participation, and specific participation. Direct participation uh, comes down from the statutory requirement wherein based on the statutes, the local government uh, ask for the public participation by forming the committees, including the members from the stakeholders, by forming subcommittees, taking reviews and reports and feedbacks from them, and accordingly, they create the policy. Whereas in case of indirect participation, the local government does not form any sort of committee. But here, people on their own, we can say the vigilant citizen on their own, they come forward and provide their expertise, their skill, their knowledge, their experiences, their research, their findings with to the local government with which the local government can develop the policies. And when it comes to the specific participation, this is usually done for a specific kind of thing, which usually does not happen in that city. But once in a while, this may happen in case of, say, natural disasters or in case of pandemic situation like this, which was unprecedented or in situation wherein people does not have their voices in cases like refugees, you know, wherein they don't have legal status in India 
or in any country but they got the refuge so raising their voices or unprecedented situations like covid in such situation when people come together and participate in the formation of a policy or uh, uh, taking uh, any such project you know which is useful and helpful for the people which protects the human right of the people then in that case we say that it is a specific kind of participation and uh, what uh, we would like to suggest through this particular research is that it depends upon the situation of that city which approach or which type of public participation they should encourage a situational analysis as i have said earlier also will be very very helpful in understanding about which sort of participation mode the local government and the people of the city should adopt right um very interesting points by especially about uh how refugees and migrant workers may also be caught in the situation where they may have limited access or limited platform yeah. to, to actually raise their concern. Uh, thanks from bring, for bringing that, that up, actually. Um, so uh, this research is, uh, as I mentioned, actually uh, um, the backbone of, of our handbook uh, on localizing human rights. Uh, why do you think, why and how do you think uh, this handbook uh, could help local government uh, particularly in addressing the, the various challenges that uh, the, the series is actually uh, facing at the moment. Do you think this handbook would be useful? Uh, and if yes, how? Yes, yeah, certainly this will be helpful. Uh, the research uh, findings pinpoints that it is the local government who is responsible for the protection of human rights at the local level and the implementation of sustainable development goal uh, will be best achieved through the uh, efforts of the local government. The local government, on one hand, does apply various participatory approaches in implementing SGDs, whereas on the other, we should not uh, forget that, that they have their own limitation, their own challenges and their own constraints. So, in some aspects, the implementation of human rights lacks inclusivity, whereas in some cases, the policies have not been properly uh, penned down and they are not so sustainable. Further, this research also mentions about the challenges, uh, you know, which has been faced by the local government considering the economic and the budgetary constraints of the local government. The local governments are working on multiple fronts and the situation is more or less similar across the globe. They have less manpower and they have many tasks to perform within a stipulated time. And that is why implementation of human rights by achieving the sustainable development goals may face some constraint or challenges. Therefore, with the help of this handbook, we try to provide the guidelines to the local government for various situations like from where they should begin for implementing human rights, how they should deal with the situational hazards or the situational challenges. For example, uh, the situation like COVID-19, how to recognize the human rights based needs of the people, how to prioritize which human right is going to be addressed first by the local government. Also, the handbook focuses on the insights about building human rights indicator, structuring of monitoring and evaluation metrics, and how to draft the policy for implementing the human rights within the city. Particularly uh, in the phase two of this research, we have also focused upon the uh, drafting of the policies which are sustainable, which by taking care of the conflict of interest between the balancing the conflict of interest between the two human rights. All these efforts which has been taken in this book is with the purpose that no one should be left behind at any point of time. 
Great. Uh, looks like um, you have captured quite a bit on the essence of the handbook itself. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just one last question. Uh, if there's any other uh, key research findings that you would like to share or you want to highlight uh, that you think local governments uh, should sort of uh, take a point uh, on that as well. Yes, certainly. Uh, while doing this research, there are many points which we have come across, which we can say now where the peripheral uh, outputs which we have reserved, received from this research. Number one is that we have seen that mostly the local government focuses on the primary human rights or you can say the generation one and generation two human rights which mainly focuses on the gender equality and environment protection but when it comes to the human rights violation of persons with disability or human rights violation of the migrants the local government is pretty silent about it or we can say that they are at a very uh, you know, primitive state wherein these for addressing this particular human rights. So the local government should work towards accommodating these people as well. Right. Uh, I think it is a very important point that you mentioned just now that uh, the rights of persons with disabilities and, and migrant workers, among other uh, people in a vulnerable situation, uh, needs to be further enhanced, especially at local level. Um, thank you very much, Payal, for your time. Uh, it's, been so a very, <laughs> it's been a very interesting discussion with you, and uh, I hope our listeners will also learn something from your research findings. Thank, thank you, you again so much. so much. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.